Uh, Sam Nadler used to say Lachaim whenever he, somebody brought him a glass of water. Um, Sam was involved in the founding of our congregation and he leads a congregation in Charlotte. And he'd say, you know what Lachaim means? It means I have water and you don't. <laughs> May remembers that one. Okay. <clears throat> we don't call it copying, we call it research. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so now that, that we've kind of caught ourselves up, the next thing I need to do, let's see if I have any more. Oh, yeah, here we go. I forgot about getting ready for this. All right. It works. Now, why did I do that? Because I want to tell you Happy New Year. Wait a minute. You may be thinking your timing is a bit off, but I hear somebody yelling it out there. You're right. My timing is off. It's not going to be New Year's for two more days, right? Now, I'm not talking about the new calendar year. I'm talking about the new year for trees. Uh, anybody heard of it? I heard somebody yell it out. Yeah, those who, who have been coming. Um, it's called Tu Bishvat uh, in traditional Judaism, meaning the 15th of this month, the month of Shabbat. And it's considered one of four new years in traditional Judaism. Why do we need a new year for trees? You may be asking, and I'm glad that you did. The answer is actually found in the Torah, uh, beginning in Vayikra, Leviticus 19, verse 23. Um, I realized I opened it up and I said Lachayim, but I never drank it. Oh, that's good. Okay. Uh, Leviticus 19, 23. When you enter the land and plant various kinds of fruit trees, you are to regard its fruit as forbidden. For three years, it will be forbidden to you and not eaten. In the fourth year, all its fruit will be holy for praising Adonai, the traditional uh, term that the Jewish people use um, for the Lord, particularly when we find the four Hebrew letters, yod Hey vav Hey, um, it, it's frequently uh, pronounced as Adonai. But in the fifth year, you may eat its fruit, so that it will produce even more for you, I am Adonai, your God. Now, one option would be to create a database of every tree planted with which today's technology might be quite doable. However, this uh, instruction has existed for thousands of years. So the Jewish people have always considered any tree from a previous year to be one year old on the 15th of Shabbat. Uh, Shabbat. 15th year of the 11th month. So now we have a new year for trees. And in Israel, it has become a tradition to plant a tree on this day. In what was once a wasteland, trees are flourishing. Israel produce is exported today worldwide in fulfillment of Yeshiyahu, Isaiah 35, verses 1 and 2, which says, The wilderness will be glad. The desert will rejoice and blossom like the lily. It will burst into flower will rejoice with joy and singing, will be given the glory of the Lebanon, the splendor of Carmel and the Sharon. They will see the glory of Adonai, the splendor of our God. These words were written long ago by the prophet Isaiah. And for 2,000 years, it seemed like it was just poetic language. There's no way that the wasteland that the land of Israel had become could ever be um, in, inhabited by large uh, population, could become a large population center, could generate produce, not just for the inhabitants of the land, but even exported worldwide. And yet we have seen this happen uh, in some of our lifetimes. And um, as, as Neil uh, also mentioned last week, um, there is uh, another new year coming up. This, is, this one will be in about six weeks. Um, in Exodus chapter 12, Shemot chapter 12, verse 2, the Lord says to Moses and Aaron, you are to begin your calendar with this month. It will be the first month of the year for you, and it goes on to provide the selection of the lamb for Passover, the lamb whose blood will be used to protect the Israelites from the final plague, the death of the firstborn. And so it, it seems perhaps from these words that at, prior to this, the time of Passover uh, that the 
year began at another time. What was considered the first month uh, might be another time of the year. However, as a result of the events of Passover, these events are so important uh, in the life of the children of Israel, in the life of God's people, that he says this is where the calendar is now going to begin. The first thing that you are going to do in the calendar year is to select the lamb, or if you couldn't afford a lamb, a, a goat, that is going to provide the blood that is going to enable me when I see the blood on the door, that is when I will pass over the houses of the children of Israel with the destruction that I am about to unleash as I demonstrate my power over the, the Egyptians, over their gods. And so um, this, this final plague, as well as the earlier plagues, but um, this final plague, we see the role of the blood. We see that it is the blood that causes the Lord to pass over the houses of the children of Israel. One of the things that we have to take from this is if they had not obeyed, it wasn't like they got a free pass. They had to follow God's instructions. Um, you know, the word Torah uh, comes from the Hebrew yara, which means uh, instruction. And that can actually work both ways. Number one, uh, I frequently refer to it. Do I have it here? No. I hold it up and I say, this is God's instruction manual um, for our lives. Uh, as we can either lean on our own understanding or we can follow the instructions that, that God has already provided. But another aspect is the Hebrew word Torah. In some translations, it, it's translated as instruction. And it says, you need to follow these instructions. And it sounds like it's talking about the whole Bible. But, uh, for example, in Joshua chapter 1, where Joshua is being given uh, his charge by the Lord, and, and, and the Lord says, This book of the Torah shall not depart from thy mouth. Well, it sounds a little different if you read it as, This book of instruction shall not depart from thy mouth. But it's really the Torah that was uh, Joshua's instruction manual as he was going to lead the children of Israel uh, into the land that God had promised them uh, to um, conquer the inhabitants of the land whose sin um, had uh, filled up to the point that the Lord said that they would be um, kicked out of the land and he warned the children of Israel. Once again, we see that there's not this you know, special preference that you can do anything you want. He says, if, if, you're, if you fill up the land with sin, the same thing is going to happen to you. You will be kicked out of the land as well. And God provides reminders. I mentioned the Mikra Kodesh earlier, the Holy Convocation, the Sacred Assembly. The children of Israel are instructed to memorialize the events of Passover, which took place on the 14th and, first, uh, 14th and 15th of the first month of the year on the Hebrew calendar, uh, as we just described, uh, which today is, is referred to as the month of Nisan, and it used to be called Dotson, okay, that's a little car joke that I never um, missed the opportunity to um, display my lack of a sense of humor uh, with regard to um, the same jokes over and over. Anyway, Exodus 12 verse 14 says, This will be a day for you to remember and celebrate as a festival to Adonai from generation to generation. You are to ce celebrate it by a perpetual regulation. And that's what we did uh, in my family growing up. Every year we would observe the Passover. Now, I don't remember a lot about uh, those events other than the story seemed to go on forever and the food never seemed to get there. Uh, but then once we ate, we had uh, the search for the Afikoman where we basically had permission to destroy my grandparents' house uh, in search for this piece of matzah uh, all for a quarter, um, such a deal. Actually, I think it was a nickel back then, but I'm giving away my age. It would buy a candy bar, I'll put it that way. Uh, I don't know what it takes. I think we give out $5 these days because that's about what it takes uh, to get, get a candy bar. I mean, this is a perpetual regulation. You're to do it year after year. Even as the cost of living goes up, we still have these traditions uh, and these observances, and it's so that we remember 
the power of God in the life of the children of Israel. We will also observe um, and commemorate these events as a congregation uh, at the Embassy Suites Hotel in Greenville uh, on Verde Boulevard on April 10th. And we'll be putting up information on our website. We'll be putting out flyers and, and you can sign up because um, this is once again a, a community event um, and, and we're to remember uh, the mighty power that God demonstrated uh, at this time. Now, while the Jewish people are told to remember these events, the Egyptians are trying to forget them uh, as they offer the children of Israel silver and gold and clothing to encourage them to go on their way. Uh, their the uh, Egyptians' lives have been miserable um, as a result of these plagues. And they feel like if they get the children of Israel uh, out of their hair, that things will start to improve. Now, I want to mention uh, one other thing from a passage in last week's Torah portion, and that is the instructions that we find in Exodus chapter 12, verses 43 through 49. Instructions concerning observing Passover for different categories of Gentiles. And um, this uh, passage and the concept that's talked about in this passage are often misunderstood and that's why I'm going to um, explore the passage a little bit right now because one of the things that we find is in this passage it doesn't say all Gentiles may partake of the Passover and it doesn't say no Gentiles are allowed to partake of the Passover it says that there are different categories of Gentile and depending on what category you're in determines whether or not you're able to participate in this ritual of the children of Israel acknowledging their God. The last verse uh, in the passage, Exodus 12 verse 49 says, there is to be Torah achat, which means one Torah for the Israelite and for the sojourner that is sojourning among them. Today, the term one Torah is often used to suggest that the Torah contains the exact same rules for Jews and Gentiles. But an examination of this passage in Exodus 12 should help us to see that there are times when this is in fact not the case. These days it should be, I have water, and so do you, because a lot of people um, tend to bring water and try to stay hydrated um, during the, the service and other times as well. Okay, uh, beginning in, in Exodus 12, verse 43, it tells us, and we're going to talk about some Hebrew terms because different translations say it a different way, but the Hebrew is exactly the same. Uh, at first, it starts out talking about ben Nachar. Uh, ben uh, means the son, uh, and Nachar uh, generally means stranger. And in Exodus 12, verse 43, it says the son of a stranger, the ben Nachar, is not to eat of the Passover. But then in the next verse, Exodus 12, verse 44, it says that an Eved, a, a servant purchased with money. Um, in, in the passage we read, uh, and even in some of our prayers, Moses is referred to as um, Moshe Abdi, uh, Moses, my servant. And here this is talking about the same Hebrew word, Eved. A servant purchased with money may eat of the Passover, provided he has been circumcised. And then the next verse, Exodus 12, 45, says the temporary dweller, the Toshav, and the hired hand, the Shakir, once again are not permitted to eat of the Passover. And then in Exodus 12, verse 48, we find the final category of Gentile who may eat of the Passover. The verse talks about Yagur Itka Ger, which I translate as the sojourner sojourning with you. Um, and this is because after describing four different categories of Gentiles, two whom may partake and two, two, yeah, two to whom participation is forbidden, Exodus 12 verse 49, as I mentioned earlier, says there is to be Torah Echad, uh, one Torah for, it says, La Ezrach. Uh, and the Ger Hagar Betochem, uh, uh, which means there's to be one set of instructions, one Torah 
for the one born in the land and the sojourner sojourning in your midst. So I'm hoping that in the, the way we've gone through this passage, you can see how those who conclude that what the passage is saying is that Jews and Gentiles have to do things exactly the same way when it comes here to the observance of Passover are simply um, not understanding what the passage is really all about. It's not about having the same rules for Jews and Gentiles, but it's which Gentiles may partake in this ritual that is required of the children of Israel, but is also allowed um, for certain of the Gentiles, the, the sojourner in their midst and the uh, servant. All right, now that that is clear as mud. Um, and, and like I said, there are theologies built on the idea that Gentiles have to keep the Torah, um, that, that Gentiles have to do things uh, exactly the same way the Jewish people do. But God in his sovereignty has made a distinction between Israel and the nations, between Israel and the Egyptians, even as we see in these plagues um, where uh, the plague affected the Egyptians, but the Israelites dwelling in Goshen were unaffected. A reminder that God has his reasons for choosing um, in his sovereignty uh, differences between the children of Israel and the nations, between male and female. That's one that I'm particularly in, in favor of. Um, I like that distinction. Some of you may feel the same way. Um, some of you may not. I don't know. That's, you know, between you and the Lord. But the, the reality is, not only has he established these distinctions for his purposes and his sovereignty, but the world would have us to blur the distinctions, to see it as not making a difference. And it doesn't make a difference because one is better than the other. Jews aren't better than Gentiles. Men aren't better than women. And women aren't better than men in God's sight. They just have different purposes. But the world would have us see any difference as an indication that we're saying that one is better than the other. And so we say that God needs to be true even if every man is a liar. That just because there's confusion uh, in our world today doesn't mean there should be confusion amongst God's people. He has his reasons. And part of it is just accepting his sovereignty. We're not going to understand everything there is to understand. Sometimes we just say, uh, as, as um, uh, I'm trying to think who it was, uh, Ezekiel says, Lord, you know. I don't know. You know, can the dry bones live? I don't know. But you know, Lord. And, and, and so, you know, sometimes that's our answer. Lord, this one is above my pay grade, as we used to say when I was in the Navy. Um, this one is in, in, in your control. And the good news is it's all in his control. If, if we didn't have that uh, assurance, if we didn't have um, that played out over and over again in the scriptures, then we might take a look at our world today. And I don't think we could blame people for saying, what in the world is going on? You know, what direction are we headed? It, it, does anybody have any control over what's going on? But as I already said, the reestablishment of the nation of Israel in, prof in fulfillment of prophecies that had existed for thousands of years, the Jewish people once again dwelling in the land that God gave to them um, for his purposes is a sign that he is in control, that, that this is all going according to his plan A, and that all we have to do is say, not my will, but thy will be done. All we have to say is, Lord, reveal your will for me as to how I am a part of your plan to advance your kingdom into the kingdoms of this world. We know that one day he's going to be king over all the earth, that he's going to rule from his throne in Jerusalem, that we're going to be surrounding the throne singing hallelujah, okay, singing worthy is the lamb that was slain, singing just and true are your ways, O Lord, king of the ages, are you and so we, we know that these things um, are going to take place now now some people are trying to look at events going on right now and say you know exactly how does this fit in and I say that the real answer is found in the Hebrew ani lo yodea which means I don't know uh, he does but I don't you know even Yeshua said that 
Um, only the Father in heaven knows the day or the hour of Messiah's return. But we know he's coming back. We, we know that um, he came the first time to bring reconciliation between the creator and the creation. Uh, and, and that also enables us to have reconciliation with our fellow man, to deal with the sin, to, to provide the blood that would be shed so that once again the Lord would say, when I see the blood, I will pass over you with the uh, punishment that you deserve for your sin, which is death. The blood will provide the atonement. And in my grace, you are able to uh, be forgiven, to, to receive forgiveness, to receive atonement, forgiveness for your sins. Uh, that's actually the promise of the New Covenant Scriptures to the Jewish people. I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more, found in Jeremiah chapter uh, 31. As uh, this all plays out with God demonstrating his faithfulness uh, to the Jewish people and sending Messiah, not as he came the first time, as the suffering servant, uh, lowly, humbly, riding on a donkey. Uh, the Jewish people sometimes refer to him as Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah, son of Joseph. But when he comes back, he's coming back, I heard a Messianic rabbi once say, with a sword in his mouth and fire in his eyes, as Mashiach ben David, Messiah, son of David, to establish his kingdom, um, to deliver the nation of Israel. You can read about it in, in Zechariah chapter 14. Uh, the nations are all lined up against them, something that we see playing out in our day. Is this the final alignment? Once again. Ani lo yodea. I don't know. It certainly could be. But there, there may be additional cycles. All I know is that as long as God is in heaven, as long as we see the signs in the heavens of the sun, moon, and stars, then the children of Israel will not cease before the Lord, as is described in, in, Is, uh, in uh, Jeremiah 31, continuing to read beginning in verse 35 through 39, that he remains faithful. And his purposes will be accomplished. And, and we just um, seek to do what he has instructed us to do as we seek a greater understanding of his will for our lives. As we seek um, his blessing on our efforts to bring the message of his unconditional love to a world that otherwise would not understand. But those who know us, who know that one time we were just selfish and we were all about doing whatever uh, we felt like doing, when they see us display unconditional love, when they see that there's been a, a change in us as a result of the Messiah in our hearts and in our lives, that can be a message um, to our friends, to our Jewish people, to our community, uh, to the world around us. Now I want to talk about this week's Torah portion called Beshalach, which means uh, begins in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. Beshalach means in letting go. Uh, as um, I know you've been wondering all along whether or not this was actually going to happen, but we find out that Pharaoh actually does let the children of Israel uh, leave Egypt. So I no longer have to say spoiler alert when I say that. The first verse in this week's portion says that the Lord has to direct the Israelites away from the shortest route because it would take them past their arch enemies, the Philistines. Exodus 13, verse 17 tells us that the Lord was concerned that fear of their longtime enemies and the prospect of war might cause the Israelites to want to go back to the land of Egypt. Now let's examine why the Israelites might prefer to go back to slavery under Pharaoh than venture toward the unknown that lay ahead. Yes, they had recently seen the Lord demonstrating his miraculous power through the ten plagues. But their future was in an unknown land with unseen challenges. And if they got too close to their arch enemies, the Philistines, the Lord knew that their instincts would be to make a U-turn, head back to the familiar misery in Egypt, rather than face down their fears of their enemies and of the unknown that lay ahead. I mentioned Keith Green in the past. Unfortunately, he died in a plane crash in 1982 at the age of 28. But one of Keith's songs is called, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt. 
The song, with a touch of humor, addresses some of the challenges of life in the wilderness. At one point, he writes of the daily diet, uh, referring to manna hotcakes in the morning and a flaming manna souffle at night. And the song fades out with him talking about more manna, manna delicacies, manna waffles, manna burgers, manna bagels, filet of manna, manna cotti, and banana bread. <laughs> Through humor, he had a serious point to make, that all too often we are just like the Israelites. We talk about the promised land, but our actions say we long for our lives back in Egypt. As we continue in the Torah portion, we find that the Israelites have some bones with them. Joseph's bones, right? Remember, Joseph knew that Egypt was not his home, just as we know that this world is not our home. According to 1 Peter 2, verse 11, we're strangers and pilgrims passing through this world on the way to our eternal destination, where we will spend the rest of eternity in the Lord's presence. Here the Lord's presence is manifest as a column of cloud by day and a column of fire at night, leading the Israelites out of Egypt. So imagine, you know, picture the, the scene. You have this column of fire at night leading the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. What, you know, could be better? I mean, surely now everything is going to go just the way um, they would want it to, kind of like, you know, having all state insurance, right? They're in good hands until mayhem strikes in the form of Pharaoh changing his mind again and deciding to chase after them. When the Israelites see the Egyptians coming, the people ask Moses in Exodus 14, verse 11, why'd you bring us out in the desert to die when we could have continued to live as slaves in Egypt? Can we identify Right now, slavery, slavery is not looking quite so bad to them. And we feel like if we had been there, things would be different, right? But remember, these are just a bunch of ex-slaves on foot with their families, with no weapons, and in front of them is a large body of water. And the Lord's presence is leading them in a cloud, but there are also mountains on both sides of them. And behind them, are the chariots and horses of Pharaoh's army bearing down on them. They have to overcome their fleshly fear, their doubts, so that they will be able to trust in the Lord. But that is much easier said than done for them and for us. In Exodus 14, verse 13, Moses says to the people, Do not be fearful. Remain steady and see the Yeshua of Adonai, the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. The Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more. Adonai, the Lord, will do battle for you. And then the column of cloud moves between them and the Egyptians. Actually, the Hebrew of Exodus 14, 19 says it is the Malach HaElohim, the messenger of God, that now stands between the Israelites and their pursuers. Exodus 14, verse 20 also tells us that the pillar of fire protected the Israelites throughout the night by keeping the Egyptians in darkness while providing light for the Israelites. What does that sound like? The plague of darkness that Neil talked about last week. And then Moses holds out his staff as the Lord had instructed him. And the waters of the sea part so that the Israelites are able to go across the Yom Suf, the Sea of Reeds, on dry ground. And after the Israelites have crossed, the Lord instructs Moses to reach out his hand again over the sea, and the waters return, and all of the Egyptians are drowned, and Moses' statement that the Israelites would not see the Egyptians again comes true. In Exodus 14, verse 31, we're told that the Israelites fear Adonai. They believe in Adonai and his servant Moses, uh, Moshe Abdo, his servant Moses. They sing a song to Adonai in Exodus chapter 15, one of the songs referred to as, the song, as a song of Moses. This song is so good, a number of messianic songs have come out of it. The chorus of a song we sing at our Passover Seder, uh, the horse and rider, comes from the first two verses of Shemot Exodus chapter 15. 
The Mikamoka from the traditional liturgy that we sang earlier comes from verse 11. And one of our Torah march song comes from verse 18. Um, Adonai Yimloch Le'olam Va'ed, it says in the Hebrew, which means the Lord will reign forever and ever. This song of Moses is a song of victory. Probably the song of Moses referred to uh, in Revelation 15, 3, uh, as Hannah read earlier and we also uh, sang earlier. As one of the um, things that we remember about these events is that the children of Israel were not on their own to do battle against their enemies. The Lord is the one who said he would fight on their side. He would provide the victory. And so when we need victory in our lives, we want to remember God as the God who is able to deliver the victory. He's done it physically for the children of Israel. He can do it spiritually for you tonight. And we find similarly in the Haftarah portion from Judges, uh, the victory of Barak over, uh, Barak over Sisera and the Canaanites in Judges 4, followed by a song in Judges 5. As once again, the Israelites are singing these songs to celebrate the victories that the Lord has given them over their enemies. Songs help us uh, to remember. And one day we'll be singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. We will sing, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord, just and true are your ways. So with God leading them, surely the Israelites will live happily ever after and do everything the Lord wants them to do, right? Just like us, right? Like the Israelites, we will not find perfection in this world. The Israelites encounter bitter waters and they complain, even though the Lord shows Moses how to make the waters sweet. They're hungry and they complain, even though the Lord provides quail and manna. And finally, another of their enemies, the Amalekites, show up to do battle. Anybody know the name of a famous, or maybe I should say infamous, Amalekite? Here's a hint. If you knew it, I would have to boo you. Come to our Purim celebration next month and you'll learn why we boo Haman. Or you can see us boo him tonight, uh, at least his name. Uh, in the battle against the Amalekites, whenever Moses' arms are raised, the Israelites prevail. But naturally, Moses' arms become tired. Aaron and Hur help Moses keep his arms raised. And Joshua is able to lead the Israelites to complete and total victory over the Amalekites. And the final chapter in the portion, Exodus 17, closes out with the Lord's instruction to write the events of the battle into a book as a memorial. Because one day he will utterly wipe out any memory of the Amalekites. Moses builds an altar and calls it Adonai Nisi, which is often translated as the Lord is my banner, but can also mean the Lord is my miracle. Will you trust him for a miracle in your life tonight? Amen. Tonight we've emphasized growing closer in our walk with the Lord so that we will lose our desire to go back to Egypt back to the old ways, the ways of the world. And we saw that sometimes we just need to look forward where he is taking us instead of worrying about what is behind us, where we've already been. It all starts with our willingness to trust in the Lord. Rob Shaul, the Apostle Paul, says in Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14, that he wants to forget what has gone on behind him so that he might press forward toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Messiah Yeshua. Now perhaps you've never trusted the Lord for his provision of salvation. Tonight you can stand still and see the Yeshua of the Lord. Yeshua means salvation. It was also uh, the Hebrew name given um, to uh, Jesus uh, when he was born uh, at the direction of the uh, messenger. And he, it, uh, it says in Matthew 1, verse 21, you shall name him Yeshua. You shall name him salvation because he will save his people from their sins. Perhaps you've been living in Egypt with the world's demands as your cruel taskmaster. As I often point out, the world will chew us up and spit us out without even giving it a second thought. But tonight you can put your trust not in this cruel and unfeeling world, you can put your trust in the creator of the universe, 
who sent his son Yeshua to die on yours and my behalf to demonstrate how much he loves us, who sent him to be the Messiah for Israel and for all mankind. So I'd like to ask with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never before accepted Messiah's sacrifice for forgiveness of your sin, but you want to hear the Lord say to you tonight, I have forgiven your iniquity and I have remembered your sin no more. All you have to do is say yes to him to apply the blood of the lamb, Messiah Yeshua, to the doorposts of your heart simply by raising your hand and putting it right back down. Is there anyone? We always give that opportunity. Now, I want, I'd like to talk to those who have already accepted Yeshua as your Messiah. As believers, we think we should never be in bondage. But as we look around, if, if we're honest about it, we will see that this world can get us in its grasp and will hold on for all it is worth. It can be some secret sin in our life. It can be some huge sin that we're unwilling to even acknowledge. But the freedom Messiah offers can break through whatever chains the adversary would use to keep us in bondage. Do you want to be set free tonight? Perhaps your old nature, your flesh, continually is calling you back to Egypt, but now you are ready to move forward, to be set free and enter the land of promise tonight, to say no to the trophies of this world, and yes to trusting in the Lord from this day forward. The Okanon John 8 tells us we can become slaves to sin, but it, if the Messiah sets us free, that is when we are truly free. Amen. So if you want to be set free tonight, I'd just like to ask you to stand right where you are. And those of you who are standing, I would ask you, do you want to go back to Egypt? Or are you ready to be set free and to go forward towards the land of promise? As Lord, you see those who are standing, it may be some who are listening uh, to, the, to the videos on the uh, internet on the Facebook page or the YouTube page. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for desiring the things of Egypt and the things of this world instead of the things that are important to you. And Lord, we are committing to trust in you as we move forward toward the promised land that you have uh, desired that we would enter into. We're committing to be obedient to you in our marriages and our families and our congregation in our relationships, in our jobs, and in all that we do. And we thank you, Lord, that you are a miracle-working God today, and you can do the impossible in our lives just as you did long ago. And we ask all these things in the glorious name above all names, the name of our Messiah, Yeshua, and everyone said, Amen and Amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming.